Hello, humans. It is I, human. Today, I want to talk about something a little more recent, a little more modern, even though most of the things I've done so far have been at least slightly dated. But because I just finished this recently, and I do still want to do some, like, game-related videos besides just the, my Twitch streams or whatever, and I'm really into, like, SMT, Persona, all that kind of stuff, uh, I definitely want to talk about Soul Hacker Studios that just recently finished it, especially because I feel like my opinion might be a little uh, contrarian to the common uh, criticisms that it seems to be having right now, which, you know, is everyone's got their own prerogative and stuff, and there's nothing nothing wrong with that. I just wanted to give my own two cents, talk about what I, what I thought about the game, because I, like, I'm very passionate about uh, SMT as a whole, and it's the franchise in its entirety. It's, like, my, it's my favorite RPG series, like, SMT4, I think, is, like, the pinnacle of RPGs. I That is my favorite RPG, probably one of my favorite video games, like, right under Resident Evil 4. I love these games. So, I, I if you've seen any of my other videos, you would know that this is very freeform. I got, like, basic notes, and I'm just going through notes and kind of talking in a more casual sense rather than reading from a script and stuff, and which is something wrong with that, but... I want to do something my own way, which is just going to be me rambling with how incoherent my brain is, and just you're hopping along for the ride, just listening to what I have to say. So this one, I really don't have many notes, because for me, I don't know how to write notes for something like this. Like, it's super easy when you're researching something that's just factual statements and not opinions, how to write notes on that. But I don't know how to write a note on, like, hey... This quality of this gameplay aspect is cool. Write that down in the notes as a coherent sentence. My brain, I don't know how to do that. So I put very vague guidelines of sections, and I'm literally just going to talk about them like that. Like, there's no sentences written on these notes for once. There's nothing specifically I'm going to say. I'm just going to do category to category until we get through everything I want to say about this, at least most of what I want to say about this. So... If you're cool with that, it's going to be an audio-only experience. I don't do, I don't tend to do anything video-related for these videos, except for like the Twitch streams. But that's that's different. That's to be like actually streaming something. Uh, so for anything like this, I I want these videos just to be something you can just listen to while you're doing whatever, you know, at work or around the house or you're, you know, driving, all that kind of stuff. Just you know, chill out, listen to some audio. Nothing you need to watch or whatever. So with that out of the way, we're gonna get right to it. Oh, but before I get too far, get a cup of coffee, get a cup of tea, I don't care, just chill. Alright, so, we're going to start, I, I, I didn't know where I wanted to start this from, if I wanted to start from a more uh, grounded point, like the gameplay aspect of it, or if I wanted to do something a little more opinion focused, I mean, not that the whole thing is an opinion, but something a little broader in a creative sense, such as like character writing and stuff, so I think I'm going to leave the more tactical stuff and the gameplay aspects for later on the video and get um get more like the characters and story stuff out of the way with first so so with that being said major spoilers finish the game first do not if if you stumble across this somehow and you haven't finished the game please go finish the game first unless you like really don't think you're going to finish the game for some reason but just so you know i will be talking about straight up like the ending and what happens throughout the whole story at least to the best of my memory <laughs> uh so yeah we're gonna. I'm gonna. My first category I have written down here in my notes is just the characters. I'm gonna start straight from that because that is some of the first stuff we saw in like the trailers and everything. So I'm gonna start with the characters, kind of the order that you get them. So yeah, definitely get used to the rambling too. It's hard not for me to do that with how horrible my train of thought is, but I don't think that should stop me from making videos because there's other people that have terrible trains of thoughts just like me. Anyways, characters. So we're going to start with Ringo as the protagonist. I love Ringo. I think her design is cool. I think her personality is cool. I only played the game with English voice acting, so I don't know how their Japanese voice actors were, but I think, I swear I knew that voice actor from something else as well, but I can't remember what it was. But I think uh, I think the voice actress, actor, whatever, uh, did a really good job with Ringo. I, I really like how... Because normally, you know, especially if you're a fan of SMT stuff, the main characters tend to not have too much of a personality. Like, think about, like, the Demi Fiend or, like, Flynn. 
Uh, they, they're, uh, they're, they're nothing. They're just, they're just a, a brick wall. But, I mean, part of that's charming to me. I, I like the kind of vague nature of the protagonist, and especially when some people kind of retroactively try to f- fit certain uh, characteristics to them, or when you see them in other media outside their own game, and then they get like a little more of a personality sometimes. I don't know, it's really cool stuff, but Ringo's definitely like an outlier with that. She definitely is way more of her own fleshed out character. Probably, honestly, like even more so than, I'd say the Persona main character. It's like she's definitely, she's just her own character. You don't really get to make decisions for her. Obviously, you can make like certain dialogue choices to increase the soul levels of the certain characters, but like what she does and how she acts is already kind of set in stone, which is something very different for this series. And it was definitely a nice change of pace. Not that I don't like the normal style. I definitely, I do a lot, but she was something drastically different. And like, and yeah, I like how her jacket looks all like, I can't think of the right word, but it's, it, it's, it's almost unnatural and it, it looks digital in, in a sense. Like it's not, it changes colors and it refracts in like little triangle pieces and stuff. It looks like some of the imagery out of I can't remember what they were, but if you played like the newer Deus Ex games, like Mankind Divided, and they had like that one virtual area during some of the story stuff that was all like like pieces and fractals and all this kind of kind of stuff if you know what I'm talking about. I can't think of the right word, but it reminds me of that aesthetic and I really like that. And I think it looks really cool as like a piece of clothing. And it just it gives her a very like like I I hate to use this because it's so like overblown right now, but it's a very cyberpunk looking jacket, you know? But I can't think of a better word for that. I, I pretty much accurately describes what I'm talking about. It's something like Something that you would think, like, in the 90s, they'd be saying, like, this is the future of fashion. But, you know, like, obviously we're not like that. But it's, like, one of those, what people thought in the past that future fashion sense were going to look like. And I really, it's it's almost nerdy in that kind of sense where it's, it's like, a very, a very um, optimistic viewpoint of how advanced we're going to be in the future. And that's what Ringo looks like, like, her, her fashion sense and her clothing. It's, like, something... That I don't think we're ever going to be like that, but it's that optimistic, oh, we're going to be so high-tech and so futuristic, even though, you know, this game's not optimistic about the future, but you, you know what I'm saying. So, Ringo, I think she's, like, one of the best protagonists we've, like, ever had, honestly. I think I think she's really, really cool. I love her uh, her comp, that it's just, like, it's, it's, it is like a sword, and, like, isn't it also kind of like a gun? Yeah, because I think it transforms during the Sabbath stuff to be, like, a gun, but I like... The sword part of it's just, like, a blade with, like, almost, like, no hilt. And it's... I don't even think it has, like, an edge. I think it's just, like, squared off. And it's just, like... And again, it look it looks ethereal. It looks digital. It doesn't look like a real weapon. I think I think it's really, really cool. And I, I believe I already said this, but I like how, like, sassy she is about stuff. And how much of, like, how much she bites back for the character... To other characters and stuff. I really like that aspect of it. And I think when I get to story, I'll talk a little bit about more of what actually happens during the story. But yeah, Ringo, I think, is one of the best protagonists. I, I loved her a lot. She's really cool. So Ringo, awesome. Next, we're going to go with the next main character we get, which would be Arrow. Now, to me, and I think many others, Arrow definitely feels like this is supposed to be like a law alignment character, even though we don't really have that in this game. This is definitely feels like that's what he's supposed to be like the... So he's like he's like totally a good guy, and he just does like good things that are like unquestionably good for the most part, um, as far as how like law characters usually are. And it, same with, I feel like less so than Melody. He doesn't go to as much of an extreme with things. Granted, maybe there's like a scene or two that I'm kind of glossing over, not thinking about it off the top of my head. I like just finished this like a week ago, so it's still pretty fresh in my head, but not like completely so but yeah starting with his design i i think it's it's i don't know if it completely stands out or anything but i do think it's visually a, a, uh, pleasing and i like the the demon icon on his back because it's like the you know like smt1 demon icons that you get and stuff oh, that might even even been in like megami tensa i'm not i'm not sure it's been a minute since i i touched that uh but yeah it's it's like the, the little demon icons from smt i really like that aesthetically uh his 
his comp is very like normal. It's just kind of like a pistol sort of thing. Kind of reminds me a little bit of the original Soul Hackers main character's comp that was just kind of like a fancier pistol sort of thing. Um, uh, his voice actor was really good too. I, I felt like he again. When I'm talking about English voice actors here. I, I feel like they did a very good job of conveying what Arrow was supposed to be like as a character. Like he's very, he's he's dense. And he's, like, almost, I, I want to say innocent, he's not, because he's, like, a devil summoner, and he's, he's done shit. And, again, we'll get into story stuff later, but obviously, like, again, full spoilers, shouldn't be listening to this if you haven't beaten the game, but with all this stuff going on with, like, uh, Kaburugi? Ruki? Can't remember his name, but his, his friends, oh, his friend. I mean, like, you straight up, Vic, you killed that guy. Like, he's not, he's not innocent, but he's, he's almost naive in the sense where he thinks, Everything can work out in some sort of peaceful fashion. Maybe like not not all the way though. Like he's not he's not stupid. He's just maybe hopeful is kind of the vibe I'm getting. But again, not not to the point where like you're like listening to the dialogue and stuff and you're thinking like this guy's a, this guy's an idiot. Like I can't believe in this world that he would be acting like that. Because obviously you have to suspend your disbelief when you play stuff like this. But it's not like Nothing he did, I felt like, was unbelievable in the sense that, like, oh, I don't think a character like that, I don't think someone would actually act like this in a situation for his character. I don't think he did anything that was, like, so naive or innocent that it was just plain stupid. Like, yeah, he tried to talk to his friend before stuff happened, but, you know, he's still going to stop him and he's still going to, like, shoot him down, essentially. Like, he's not, he's not so like, goody two-shoes that he's going to stop from doing something that's actually important and helpful to the overall greater good. So, yeah, Arrow... Arrow's probably, like, my third favorite if I had to pick out of the main characters. I, li I, I Again, I like him a lot, though. That's not me saying I don't like him. I think he's also a, a pretty good character design. He's just not my absolute favorite in the game, but that's not... As far as, like, SMT characters as a whole go, I think this game did really good. Like, they're all, honestly, like very memorable to me and very iconic so like w while he's not my favorite in the game i still think he's a, a super cool design his character definitely brings some uh, some more level headedness to some of the situations and it's, he's he plays a very important role in the party dynamic especially especially if we're talking about the raven stuff which i'll get into later right now for characters i'm just talking like playable characters i'm going to talk about the other characters in the story section um so on that note we're going to talk about milady or it looks like you'd want to pronounce it milady which would be a dumb name if you ask me <laughs> but uh everyone pronounces it milady in the english dub i don't know how it's pronounced in the japanese dub but we're going to go with milady um very clearly in my opinion she's supposed to be like the chaos representative of well, maybe not representative but kind of following that sort of path. Um, she's my least favorite out of the four main characters, but again, I still think she's a very strong character. She's still a very interesting and fun character to watch, uh, like, throughout the story sections, and she's very important to the party dynamic, kind of giving them the balancing out Arrow, essentially, with some of the more extreme, you know, chaos-oriented viewpoints and while I think some of her opinions are more extreme than, like, Arrow's, I don't think there is too much where, again, I was like, this is ridiculous or this is unbelievable. It was more so there's a couple things. Like, if we're going to talk about, say, like, the one scene at the orphanage when she was, like, ready to take that kid hostage. Like, yeah, that was extreme like much more extreme than I think what Arrow would have done. But, like, you could totally get where she was coming from, because it was more so for the greater good sort, sort of thing. And then, obviously, she was very emotionally charged. It's not like, at, at, in the end, I don't think it was something that, like, she wanted to do as a character. But it was more of a means to an end and, like, it, a necessity. You know, the lesser to evil sort of thing, where, like this was the quickest route to get rid of the biggest problem and even though it was extreme it wasn't like watching that scene to me it wasn't like oh no one would act like this it was like yeah this is extreme and this was reprehensible but like it makes sense and it's not like she was didn't feel like guilty after it so again like i think they did a really good job 
with not straying too far in either direction of because I feel like with some of the games, and you know that's that's half, half the fun, but like some of the games, either like the Law or the Chaos Path, it's like this is way too extreme. Like I don't want to, I don't want to pick one of these. I just want to go straight neutral. That feels like what I'm supposed to be doing. Granted, that could that could just be my bias. I tend to feel like I gravitate towards the neutral paths in the SMT games, but again, that's that's probably just my bias showing for what I tend to like. I mean, because there's games where I think I like the law representatives more, or I like the chaos representatives more, depending on the game. Like, I love Walter in SMT4, even though I personally still think the neutral path is the the path that I would pick if I had to, like, morally. I think Walter's a super cool character. Not that Jonathan isn't, but, like, I love Walter in that game. Like, he, he's super cool. And there's, there's games where I like the law characters, like, you, you know, it, it goes both ways, but generally speaking, I like the neutrality of it. And some games are more heavy-handed in the representatives. And I think with this game, even though they're not, like, explicitly representatives of Law and Chaos, I think they, they do a very good, a believable job while still being extreme enough to kind of point out, like, ah, that's that's what they're doing, that's what this character is kind of supposed to be like. So I think, like, visually, there's definitely people that I think would absolutely love her design. She's very... I almost wanted to say pointy. Like, she's very, like, unlike, like, like Arrow looks, like, subdued and almost kind of normal. And Melody looks, like, aggressive. Like, she she looks way more wild, in, in my opinion. And I love I love her comp that's just, like, two sides. It's, it's very, like, it, it, yeah, it's very, like, aggressive. Like, she's like an assassin, which, you know, I believe that is what she's supposed to be at the end of the day. She's, she's very colorful very loud like visually and i think it's a really good look for the personality of the character and again going back to the voice actors i think everybody did a really good job i think the voice actress has a really good like really good and and she also has like sarcasm but in a different way of ringo's where like ringo's sarcasm is like playful while melody feels like she's insulting you and she's kind of condescending and it's a different way of conveying the same type of sarcasm, but they have different meanings and different connotations. I mean, I feel like, I feel like the voice actors really did a good job of making, making her feel kind of, you know, like, like she was tense, like, like, like not that she was like snippy or anything, but like she was really deliberate with getting under your skin. I think that's the best way to describe it. There's like, I wish it was. I wish I could find the word of exactly how her character is like, because it's not. It's not playful. It is kind of aggressive and it is condescending, but not in a super antagonistic way. More of someone, and I think again, this is probably what they're going for. But more of someone who is putting up a front of aggressiveness, and I definitely think that's what she was doing as a character. And obviously, she has so much to do with Iron Mask, like the main villain for most of the game, and I'll get into that more in the story section, but that was a really interesting dynamic to her character to actually have her be tangentially related to, like, the, the villain. I think that was a really cool kind of point of this this game, where you don't usually see that kind of stuff, like, one of your main characters is, you know, was, like, dating the villain. It's 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 a really cool, di- really cool dynamic. So, yeah, but she is my least favorite of the party. But again, that does not mean, like, I don't think she's a bad character. It's just all the characters are so good. Again, if this wasn't just me talking about Soul Hackers 2, and if this was talking about SMT as a whole, I think all four of the main characters are super iconic in their own ways. Their designs are great. Their voice acting is great. Their characteristics are just, I think I already said designs. But, yeah, I think they're all super good characters. She's just my least favorite of the party. And with that... We have the last character you get in the party, and you probably could already uh, suss this out at this point that Saizo uh, is definitely my favorite of the party. Favorite, probably, of the entire game. I absolutely love Saizo. Every every scene he was in, which was, you know, all of them, because the part is like in every scene, but you get what I'm saying? Like, every scene he was the center of. He is such a fun character. He, again, so he's definitely supposed to be, like, neutral, uh, a neutral representative like he's he i wouldn't say that he toes the line he just doesn't commit to anything on either side he's literally 
just kind of looking out for himself. He's not extreme about anything. Um, but yeah, as like a personality, he is he is so fun in my opinion. He's so he's kind of he's almost like a, a playboy in some senses, but like it's definitely to me again, it's like it's like a front. He's trying to be cool, but he's 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 not cool. He's kind of lame, and he's he's you know just trying to act cool and like a player and stuff. But you can tell that that's not what he is. He's just trying to put on appearances, and he's he's kind of he's kind of lame, and I I love that about him. I I think he's very relatable in a sense. He just seems like he's genuinely like a good dude. You got everything going on uh, with his girlfriend, kind of girlfriend, not girlfriend, whatever is going on with Ash and all that dynamics, which, again, I'll talk about more in the story. I really like that whole aspect, too. I think it really fleshed out his character rather than just being neutral guy that's not saying too much one way or another. He, he's very... Uh, he's, he's just very playful, and, again, a very good addition to the dynamic of the party. Like, everyone fills out a certain role, like, perfectly, and with all of them combined, they make a really interesting and fun party to experience the story through the lens of. And his comp is my favorite. I love the... So it's like a, it's a Tommy gun, and it's got a little, like, shark thing on it with, like, like a little booyah thing. I think that's what you call those things, things that float in the water. Uh, and I, I, it's because it's... A, it's very, um, it's unnecessary. It's 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 frivolous, it, not not frivolous, um, flamboyant, and unnecessary. And it's just cute shark thing on gun. I I love that because it's just a completely unnecessary addition, but that fits with this character so well of just adding something gaudy just for the sake of it, even though it doesn't benefit him in any way. And yeah, again, voice actor I think does a phenomenal job with the character. Like the, the voice talent they got for this game is like great. I really like all of it. And I didn't hear the Japanese voice, but if the quality of the English dub is anything to go by, I'm sure the Japanese voices were just as good. And yeah, his design, I love his design. It's definitely like a gangster, and it, it kind of plays into again how like gaudy he is with some stuff because it's like all white. He's got, like, the scarf and stuff, and it looks over the top and unnecessary. And, again, I find that very charming. He's, he's a very, very likable character, in my opinion. And I, I wonder how other pe people felt about him. I don't know if it's just, if he's just the perfect type of character I tend to gravitate towards, or if other people kind of got the same impression where he's just, he's, like, a really lovable goofball. And I really, I really love those types of characters. He's really good at, like... And it, but he's he's also not just like a comic relief punching bag either. Like say if we're talking about like Yosuke in Persona Four or something, where obviously Yosuke has a bunch of s serious moments in the games and the spinoffs or whatever. But like half the time he's like comic relief punching bag, and uh, I feel like he's trying to fill out the same type of role though. But with Saizo, he's not like like stupid idiot best friend kind of guy. He's like he he's funny, but more so because of how he is as a person, not because he's being a punching bag for, like, a joke or something. He's just, he, he he's a lovable goofball. I think that's the best way of describing him. Even though, obviously, he has a bunch of serious moments, too. But he's he doesn't seem to want to commit to being too serious about anything. And he more just so wants to keep tensions low and not really... I wouldn't say that he doesn't step in anybody's toes, but he just doesn't want to get... He doesn't want to get involved with making anybody too antagonistic towards him. And again, I think it fits with his character super well. Like again, and I kind of I feel like with Melody and Saizo especially, they're like they, they put on like a front, and I kind of do like that. And it's something, and this is a little kind of getting off off the point a little bit here, but I think it's something I really enjoyed about this game. They're putting on fronts, and like they're trying to like kind of protect themselves emotionally. I think, which is. Really, a really cool com comparison, or, or in comparison to, say, like, other SMT or Persona, where a lot of what you have is, like, high school students, where, obviously, they're acting a little more emotionally charged, and I wouldn't say unintelligent in situations, but they're acting more rashly, and they're acting more on emotions and stuff, where uh, Soul Hackers, too, I feel like the characters are well-written in the sense of how like adults might do things and how they might be more playing things close to the vest, so to speak, and more so putting on a front 
if they have, like, you know, if they're trying to protect themselves emotionally and stuff. And I feel like I'm doing a psychology breakdown of these characters at this point. I'm not trying to do that. But if, if you played a lot of uh, Atlas Media, and I'm more so, sorry, I'm just kind of talking about SMT and Persona as a whole. But you definitely will see what I mean, where these characters are way more grounded than, say, like, a Persona character or... Like, like it's it's a weird comparison to make, like, SMB4, because while I do think those characters aren't supposed to be, like, like adult adults, they, they don't really act like teenagers, I guess. It's not like playing Persona 4 or 5 or even 3 in that sense. I think it's the same reason why, and I'm not trying to be, like, a boomer here, but the same reason I like, like, Persona 2 Eternal Punishment so much is, like, besides, like, well, you know, even Maya's, like, working a job, like, all the characters are, like, adults and it's much more relatable to me at this point in my life than like the persona characters and again this is not me like 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 just dissing the persona stuff because i i love that stuff i literally just started playing persona 5 again because it's on game pass now and i just i'm doing like a third play for that game now and i don't usually play rpgs like multiple times oh like i, I kind of started to do that recently now that especially now that i play rpgs a little differently than i used to when i was younger but yeah, no, I still, like, I absolutely love those characters and the stories and everything, but, not, like, I'm pretty far removed from my high school years at this point. So, I find, again, like, Persona 2 Eternal Punishment and, like, the Soul Hackers 2 cast, it's it's less of a leap of logic for me to relate to these types of characters, because it's a lot more, it's a lot more natural of an environment and kind of more natural problems for people my age, as opposed to, like having trouble in school kind of thing like at this point i have trouble relating to that because it's again it's so far removed from me and i'm really <laughs> i'm really showing my age at this point um but and again not that i don't like that kind of stuff but this this game is really cool and i kind of ask and it feels like this is the kind of game that is growing with the fan base on these games like maybe some of the people that started were teenagers like when i first played like persona 3 portable that was like the first one I played. I, I was a teenager and I was in high school, but at this point in my life, it's been it's been a long time since then. Um, and you know, things are different. Life is different. You got different types of problems, and it's cool when these types of franchises can kind of grow with that certain type of audience. Granted, that's not always like financially smart. Sometimes to take Persona Five for example, that while it still has a similar setting to like Four and Three, I still feel like it can still capture the adult audience while still being very relatable for a younger audience getting into the series. But, you know, this is this isn't trying to be an analysis of all SMT and Persona franchises. It's just a comparison point I wanted to make that I feel like as an adult now, these types of characters and situations are much more relatable. And I don't mean the apocalypse. That's not super real. Well, you know, with the climate crisis and everything, I guess it is economically. Oh, boy. Uh, other than that, you know, the apocalypse and demons aren't very relatable yet. However, speaking, the more adult problems definitely are more so relatable. That's, that's, that's the point I'm trying to get. I know there's more of a long tangent and kind of rambly thing, but I hope that's what you signed up for, because that's what I'm doing. So for the last character of the section before I just talk about the story in general, because I'm not going to talk about any other characters until we get to the story section, but I feel like Feig is kind of in your party. I know she's not in your party as far as gameplay is concerned, but... She is very much in your group, like, the whole game, and involved in pretty much everything you're doing. And so, at first, she definitely just feels like a more reserved extension of Ringo. And because they kind of are, you know, they're just agents of Ion or whatever. They're computer beings. And I get, you know, I realize I didn't even mention that when I was talking about Ringo. And I feel like that's because that's just how good of a character she was. They easily could have gone, like, the Igus route with these characters, but... They're, yeah, they're like, they're, I don't want to call them robots, because I don't think they're technically like robots, but they are artificial beings, and they're like computers, in a sense, like they're, they're, they're not, they're not human, they're learning how to be human, and learning about humans, and interacting with humans, but they're not flat characters, they're not, they're not nothing, they're, they're very much, they have their own personalities, and while I feel like Ringo is more, I wouldn't say loud, but she's a lot more bombastic, a lot more sure of herself. Feig is, seems more reserved, and I wouldn't say that she's, like, unsure of herself, but she's definitely 
she's not as vocal and not as loud of a voice in the party. And she's definitely just kind of helpful on the sidelines, sort of. No, I wouldn't say sidelines, but... Like, she, she doesn't take as active of a physical approach in solving the problems throughout the game. She's more a of an intelligence kind of person where she, she's working in the background. That's that's a bit... Because it's not like what she does in the story isn't important, but what she does is definitely less physical, more intelligence-based, I guess. Like, more, like, figuring out what to do and figuring out certain plans and what's next and understanding the covenants and all this kind of stuff. And then, obviously, what happens, happens... But I will talk about that more in the story section because I want to kind of go through that in a little bit of a chronological order. But I do think, I do think what happened with her was kind of it was a bit of a sharp turn. But I don't think it was an unrealistic turn. I know a lot of people were saying how like, oh, like I don't, I didn't find this believable, and I, I don't think there's enough time to see this come to fruition. And I, I disagree. And I'm not going to make this whole video about why I don't agree with other people's opinions because it's not that i don't understand people's opinions i feel like too many people are like i don't agree with this opinion therefore it's wrong like no these opinions are super valid i totally understand where people are coming from like it's it's not unrealistic or just like dumb opinions about this kind of stuff like every what everybody's saying like it's totally it could totally be true it's just it's not the opinion that i personally hold in it i don't like when people are like oh you don't like x therefore you're wrong it's like no, like, if, if you can still understand where people are coming from, even if you disagree with what they're saying, it's not, it's not one extreme or an, another. Like, people, and people can still like things while being critical of it. I just, that's kind of not, not so much my thing. If I, I, to me, when I find something I like, I kind of just like it. And it's hard for me to pick it apart in a sense of that I actively will start to dislike parts of it because I know, like, critically speaking, it's off. To me, if I like something, I kind of just like the whole package. It's not that I don't understand the flaws of it, but it's more so if I... It's it's like a... And I know I just said I'm not picking the strings, but it's like if I like something, it's kind of just an on or off switch. It's like I either like something or I don't. It's not like I like it with caveats if we're talking about a piece of media. Like if I watch a movie and it's like it's okay, but I still had enjoyment with it, then I like the movie. Yeah, if, if that kind of makes sense. Or... It's not a matter of not understanding criticism. It's just a matter of the whole package kind of outweighs any negatives for me. If, if you know, if I enjoy the product. So, in that note, I it's kind of hard to talk about Fee as a character without talking about the story. So, in on that note, I can't believe this has been going on for 30 minutes to try and talk about the, the characters in a very broad sense. And I don't know if I should be sorry about that or if that's exactly what you signed up for. Then you're absolutely welcome that I ramble on for this long about it. So, on that note, I want to finally get to the story, and this is only my second section. It's probably going to be a longer video than I thought, but again, this is the type of this is the type of content I personally like. This is what I like to listen to, and I hope you're enjoying yourself. If you do, you know, I'll... I'll I feel like I, I don't want to, but I have to show myself a little bit, I think. If you're enjoying the video, like it, uh, leave a comment, share it with other people. Rather, share it with people that you think would very much enjoy this. I don't want to shove this down anybody's throats. That's not going to be, like, super into this exact type of format. Like, I know I'm going for a very niche kind of market here. Not market. Because at the end of the day, I'm doing this for myself. Like, like screw anybody else. <laughs> no, you know, no no offense. At the end of the day, this is just a creative outlet for me. And I there's so many different things I want to talk about and I want to do. And, you know, so, like, like yeah, at the end of the day, this is for me. But, obviously, you know, I'm not going to beat her on the bush. It would be super cool if people watched the video if they liked it and all that kind of stuff. And I don't mean, like, pressing the like button. I mean, like, actually enjoyed what they were listening to. All right, that's enough craziness. Let's talk about the story now. Here's where this aspect and the gameplay aspect, I think, is what I really want to talk about. But I wanted to get more of the uh, opinionated stuff out of the way with first. Maybe not out of the way, but, uh, you know, the less grounded, the gr less grounded explanations and less grounded discussion of this. So, the story it has a, a really cool setup to me. I like the fact that it's like, okay, obviously it's very SMT, we got the apocalypse coming, you know, blah blah, big scary beings, and the world's gonna end. Kind of, you know, your usual fare for these types of games. And, like, I love that. I, I know it's been the same thing every game. Obviously not the exact same thing, but the same type of premise for most of these. 
And, you know, it gets me every time. I love the occult. I love talking about the apocalypse. I love all the demons. I love all this kind of stuff. It's, you know, it's totally, like, my type of adventures. It's right on my alley. Uh, so, yeah, you know, same general type of premise. But, you know, it kind of starts with a bit of a twist with the fact that the your, your main party, and again, huge spoilers for everything. If you made it this far, what are you doing? Go play the game. Um, so, obviously, your whole party's, like, dead. Besides Ringo, and you need to bring you need to bring bring these bad boys back to life. So obviously Ringo or Arrow, Arrow's dead. You do the soul hacking nonsense. You bring him back to life, and soul hacking, you know that is the title of the game, Soul Hackers too. And so soul hacking in this game, you know, if you played it, you already know what I'm talking about. But we're going to be talking about it anyways. Is you can bring someone back from the dead essentially by doing so. Like I still don't understand exactly what it is. Because, you know, near the end of the game, they talk about how it's not just bringing people back from the dead, but altering people. So, I don't I don't know exactly what they're supposed to be doing, but what I do know is that you can bring people back uh, back from the dead with it. Granted, I think it, you know, I think they're pretty clear about how it's to be, like, very soon after they die, and they have to be, like, willing to come back. Because, you know, like, immediately Ringo is negotiating with Arrow to be like, hey, you know, you don't actually want to be dead, do you? Like, don't you want? Don't you want to come back? And I, I you know, just as a, a little note, I love. And I don't remember exactly what like the phrasing was, but when she brought Arrow back, and Arrow was like, "Oh, you know, I can do whatever or something like," and Ringo was like, "Are you sure? Because like last time you kind of ended up with your head pulped in or something." And I, I really liked that response. Or again, again, like you know, she's a really lovable character. So you bring back Arrow. And you find Melody, you bring her back. She's being, like, hunted by the Phantom Society, which is what she's a part of. Wow, I forgot to mention that. So, Arrow and Melody are part of two opposing demon summoning factions. And so, but when you when you meet Melody, she's being hunted by her own faction, if I'm remembering exactly the turn of events properly. And you bring her back, and obviously her and Arrow don't really get along, because they're from opposing factions. And then eventually, you know, you you fight one of the people from the Phantom Society, and Ringo raps back to them because they are a rapper. That was amazing. I love that. I don't, I don't care what anybody says. That was not cringy. It was fun. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so obviously that kind of starts setting things in motion a little bit, and then you you get to Sizo. Uh, Sizo's girlfriend kills him essentially, or it sets him up to be killed. And even though I think it was supposed to be kind of an accident, but, you know, she probably kind of knew better a little bit. So then you bring Sizo back, and then you got your, you got your jolly little band of, band of people. And the whole premise at this point right now is these people are the ones required to stop the apocalypse according to the great AI being known as Ion or whatever. The Ion's like a computer sort of entity kind of voice in the, the, the sky. <laughs> Not the sky, but you know what I mean. Like when you're chilling in the, I uh, uh, almost call it the metaverse. <laughs> not the not the metaverse. The uh, um, the place where the soul the soul matrix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soul matrix. Uh, you know, she's just kind of like a disembodied voice. Or she, Ion is just an entity. I don't know, but yeah. So like Ion wants Ringo, who is an extension of Ion and Fig, to. Because they are extensions of Ion in a physical form to connect with human beings. And their whole point is, obviously, Arrow, Melody, and Sizer are, like, the keys to stopping the apocalypse. But, you know, they're kind of dead. So you kind of need to bring them back to life. And then you can get started. So one of the main, like, talking points throughout the story is these things called covenants. Which are, like, these kind of soul-like looking thingies that can grant additional powers to certain people, and if you bring them all together, you could probably, you know, start the apocalypse if you wanted to. So that's kind of a major talking point throughout the story. So what you kind of know is that, you know, if somebody has all the covenants together, that's probably pretty bad. And if you have, like, a covenant, you can see other people have covenants. If you give them, like, a demon, they could be really strong. And you can transfer covenants to somebody else if you die. So, like, if somebody kills you, they can take your covenant, essentially. And other than some exceptions, that's kind of the role for it. Like, you have to at least die or make your body believe you're dying to pass on a covenant. So covenants have, like, special supernatural kind of powers. And there's there's this dude 
named Iron Mask who's collecting them and throwing them in this artificial demon. Um, what, what was his name? Zenon or something? And so he's throwing all the covenants in him and he's going to use them to like start the apocalypse and remake the world into something better than it is. Because in the universe of Soul Hackers 2, in the, in the distant future, seems like everything sucks and everything financially seems pretty bad. Living conditions don't seem good. Everyone's kind of just messed up. And, you know, obviously that's totally just fictional and in the far, far future. And we're totally never going to be like that. Uh, so yeah, Iron Mask, he doesn't like, he doesn't like the way the world is and he's gonna, he's gonna start it. He, he's just a fresh slate, clean slate. Like this, this whole society thing isn't, isn't working out for him. Um, and so I, I want to take this chance to talk about Iron Mask as a character, and I'll talk a little bit more about him in a minute. But my God, I love his design. He is super cool. I love, I love the the suit with the stripes. I love the mask, the and how like his eye, not his eyes themselves, but how like the mask kind of glows. His eye eye socket things glow red and stuff. Um, I love the kind of distorted effect they give his voice. When, he, when he's talking, and again, voice actor, great voice actor for that role. Uh, he's very intimidating. He's very almost cryptic. And he feels like he's above you. Like he's some sort of untouchable entity, even though he is just a person. And his comp is probably the coolest one. It's like a sawed-off shotgun. So, yeah, he's very, he's very intimidating. They did such a good job with making him feel like a force to be reckoned with. Like something that you cannot take on. And, like, I love, and I'm going to talk more about music in, in a bit, but I love the music that plays, like, during his first boss fight and stuff. They, do, they did a really good job of making him feel, like, intimidating and, like, man, I don't know how we're going to take care of him kind of deal. Like, I could gush on and on about Iron Mask. He is really cool. And I really want to talk about him more in a bit after we get a little farther on and talking about the story. But, yeah, from, from a first, even just a first impression, I think it was very strong. They, they they really did a good job of just making him. He's a really he's a really good antagonist. He he really feels like an unstoppable force that your party has to somehow overcome. They did an amazing job with setting him up. I think. So as we continue here, it's kind of a cat and mouse game of getting close to Iron Mass, and then he's like kind of stomping on you with his artificial demon. It's Zoma. That's what it's called. It's a Zoma. Because I think that was the thing in Soul Hackers 1, too. Uh, like an artificial demon that didn't have an alignment. I want to say that's what it was. And then you can kind of just use it no matter what your alignment was. Uh, that's That sounds right. Um, I'm not going to be talking about Soul Hackers 1 like at all in this video. Because I feel like these are just separate entities. I'll get that out of the way with right now. They're kind of just separate entities. I might talk about it a little bit at the end. But th this is definitely like, like kind of its own thing. So anyways, yeah. it's It's very much like... You know, you're getting closer to him, he kind of stomps on you, things are escalating throughout it, and then you have stuff kind of going on on the side as the fight with Iron Mask keeps ramping up, because it's not like, you know, not one singular fight, but you keep kind of getting closer and closer, but he's still, he's still like a step ahead of you every time. But on the side, we got, we got the plot going on with Arrow, who, there was a, a Kuzunoha, who was, who was like a, who was a devil summoner, that seems... Like a very powerful one in his faction of Devil Summoners that seems to have been like spying on him, and you're like, "What is that all about?" He has no idea what that's all about, but he's like, "He's dead. He's dead." All your mass like kill him, uh, so he's not even in the picture anymore. But he's a very powerful Devil Summoner that has some sort of connection to Arrow, but Arrow doesn't know what it is, and nobody else knows what it is. So that's going on. You also make some visits to this orphanage that Arrow grew up in, that. Uh, is connected again to his faction a little bit, but it, there's this like mentor of his, Raven, that runs the orphanage, and you know he's taking care of the kid and stuff there. So that and he's kind of helping you out and giving you information throughout you trying to find Iron Mask and trying to get closer and closer to him every time. And then you have the stuff going on with Melody because she was dating Iron Mask, so everyone is kind of like, "Why are you helping us then? Like, like what, what's your deal?" And I so at this point. You know, I may be getting things a little out of order, but so eventually you do, you do figure out that, okay, the, the Iron Mask that Melody was dating is not the Iron Mask you're fighting. You know, he's, he's dead. So that one, that one could be kind of obvious. I didn't personally see that coming. 
I kind of just think I was more so thinking that she just thought maybe he was getting too extreme or something. But, you know, at the same time, she was pretty clear that she also wanted the world to end. But, you know, she was helping you fight fight her, her boyfriend, essentially. So I guess I guess I guess I should have seen that coming, but maybe sometimes I'm a little dense. So, anyways, Iron Mask is not the same Iron Mask, so it's somebody else. Granted, I don't know if she at the time, story wise, is supposed to know who it really is, but all you do know is that it's not the same person anymore. So that's what's going on with Melody. Saizo has his own own thing going on too, because Obviously, his girlfriend kind of led him to dying, and that's kind of a sticking point between the two. And you do get in a fight with her, and she's, like, helping the Phantom Society, if I'm remembering correctly. Excuse me if I'm not. Either way, she's antagonistic towards your group and Saizo and stuff. And he just wants her to, like, you know, like, not fight. And he kind of just wants to, you know, be with her. And even with everything that happens, you know, he's kind of just, like... You know, he doesn't blame her, and he just kind of wants to be with her again. But obviously she feels responsible for what happened, and she kind of takes that to an extreme of pushing him away and just kind of being like, well, this is what our lifestyle of being a devil summoner is leading up to, and she's kind of just pushing him away because she thinks this is the only way it can be, and she doesn't want she doesn't want any, like, false promises of, like, a good life from size anymore. Because he is a smooth talker with maybe not... All the time, there's something behind what he's saying. Sometimes it might just be fluff. But I feel like she just took that to an extreme as a reaction. And, not, and again, I'm not saying that as in, like, oh, this was an unbelievable development. But more of someone that kind of was pushed to the brink and is reacting in a way to maybe save herself emotionally from what she kind of caused to happen. So there's all that stuff's going on. And like I said, like, her boss fight was really cool. I liked some of her unique attacks like that, uh... Ashes to Ash stuff. That like that attack was super cool. Um, so, and also with Arrow, I don't want to get to that. You fight his childhood friend that was also raised in the same orphanage, if I'm remembering right. But I think he was part of the Phantom Society. So, while he was part of the, the opposing faction, which I'm not going to pronounce, I I'm not Yagatarasu, I believe, is somewhat near it, but that's probably not going to be pronounced right. So. So since they were kind of on opposing sides, you know, they can't really work together or anything, even though they were friends. So you eventually have to fight him, and you do kill him, because he's kind of in your way when you're trying to get to Iron Mask and stuff. So that's that's a whole thing that goes down. And I think I think, I think it was really cool in a way. So obviously that's hard for Arrow, and he, but he understands that he kind of has to do it for the greater good. And I like how, like, later on he has, like, a drink with him in the sense that he was like oh you know no matter what happens you know we're gonna go for another drink or whatever and he he goes out like with himself just to have a drink but he's talking about he's reminiscing on their childhood and being friends or something it was kind of a sweet moment it was very somber because you know you can't actually you know spend time with him anymore but it was it was a really touching moment and like even though he did what he had to do and they were on opposing sides of the end even though he like he had to kill him he was still like in the end, he was still his friend, and he still, like, kind of had a, a, a drink with him, so to speak, even though he didn't actually. And that, that was a really touching moment, in, in my opinion. I, I really liked that a lot. So, we got all this stuff going on, you know. Arrow is somehow related to the Kuznoha Devil Summoner. He doesn't know how. Um, he kills his friend. You got Melody, who's trying to fight against the new Iron Mask, cause, because Iron Mask killed the previous Iron Mask. I know. Iron Mask Inception. So obviously she, at this point, wants the revenge on the current Iron Mask. And you got Saizo trying to bring back Ash and make her stop fighting with him and stuff. So everybody's kind of got their own personal stuff going on while Ringo and Fig are just kind of trying to understand the Covenants and get the Covenants. And again, their whole goal still is to end the world. But they are helpful to the party, like, the entire time. Like, you're all one group. Even though they're kind of all trying to accomplish specific individual things, and they all tie together in, like, the greater good kind of kind of sort of thing. So it's not like Arrow doesn't want to stop the end of the world, but it, he also has his own personal stuff to deal with. And granted, even though Melody does kind of want to end the world, she still 
is helping for the greater good just to at least for now get revenge on the current Iron Man. So whether or not her end goal aligns with yours, she's still helping you. And obviously Slice was kind of just neutral and just trying to help his girlfriend or ex-girlfriend, I guess, at this point. So that's kind of where we're at right now. And excuse me if I gloss over something or if I say something that's like slightly incorrect. You know, my train of thought's not the best. My memory's not the best. So I'm just kind of going off of, you know, what I remember. So we got all this stuff kind of happening at this point. And so eventually through the soul matrix, which is this thing that through Ion you can kind of enter. And it's something similar, like if you played Persona 5, uh, Mementos, where it's like a subconscious kind of thing where you can go through people's like minds, essentially. Um, it's a very vague way of explaining it, but essentially through... There's separate soul matrices for each of your party, and you learn more about them by going through them. So, kind of an optional dungeon, kind of, not really, but... So you learn more about them through going through that. And at one point during the story, you get, like, a new section of um, Arrow's soul matrix because you learn that he actually has a covenant that's kind of, like, sealed inside of him, so he can't, like, use it, or and he can't, like, sense other people that have one. But after you do a boss fight with Iron Mask at one point... He, like, drops a phone or something. Or, no, it was it was the Kuzunoha guy's phone, I think, if I'm remembering this right. And, like, Fig gets her hands on the phone, and she kind of was able to get some data off of it, and you get some notes and stuff, and then you're like, yeah, so Arrow has a covenant, but it's, like, sealed inside of him, so he didn't know, and he can't, like, sense other people with it. So you get a new part of Arrow's soul matrix, and you kind of, like, unlock his covenant, or, like, unseal it. And you kind of learn what happened was that the Kuzunoho guy, through his original stuff, figured out if he, like, cut off his arm, he could make his body think he was dead so he could transfer the Covenant to Arrow and seal it to keep it safe so, you know, nobody else could get it. But at this point, Arrow, you know, they unseal it. And so now Arrow can sense if anybody else has it. And, you know, maybe he'll get, like, an additional power from it. Maybe not. And I realized I glossed over this. I'm getting a little out of order because this is important too. At one point during like the second, I think, Iron Mask fight, you kill his artificial demon and you, so all the covenants get sent into Iron Mask instead. So now he himself actually holds on to the covenants. And again, you know, the people with covenants can sense other people with covenants. So Arrow unlocks his covenant and at one point you visit the orphanage with his mentor Raven to talk about what their next plan is. And then you go there and this scene got me so hard. I was, and I, I feel like I saw other people said like, Oh, I saw this coming. And I'm thinking like, what? Like, no way. Again, maybe I'm just super dense, but I did not see this coming. So anyways, you go to the orphanage and arrows like, you got to leave right now. And everyone's like, wait, why? And, you leave, and then you find out he sends all the covenants in Raven, the guy that's been kind of helping you, uh, Arrow's mentor. He's taking care of all the kids and stuff. He is the new Iron Mask, even though Iron Mask is working for the Phantom Society that's the exact opposite of Arrow Society. Uh, he's Iron Mask, and I did not see this coming. This got, this this was like a gut punch. I was like, no, I'm like, I love Raven. He just seems like a good dude. He's just taking care of kids and just kind of helping out. He's a good dude. He doesn't do anything like that. Uh, but no, yeah, I, God, that scene was so good. I just, I can't, I can't get over that scene. And just be like, no, we, we have to leave like right now. And then, you know, everybody kind of talks about what happens. And so then, then what happens like, immediately after is Melody goes over there. It's like, I'm going to kill him. Now that I know who it is, I'm going to kill him. And she like goes there and she's like, I'm going to take one of these kids hostage. She's like, I'm going to kill Raven. Like, I can't do this. And obviously she breaks down. She doesn't actually take the kid or anything like that. And she's crying about it and stuff. And so at this point, too, Fig liked going over to the orphanage and helping with the kids and kind of cooking and whatever, whatever she was doing. And she, at this point, grew to be, like, in love with Raven. And so this isn't very sweet for her because she... And she tries to, like, talk to him about it, but, you know, he's kind of like, you know what, just, you know, you guys know what's going on at this point. Thanks for not starting anything here, but, like, we'll end this, like, go meet me so-and-so place so we can, like, quote-unquote talk about it. But, you know, it's, it's not, you're not talking about it. You're, you're fighting to the death at this point. So this is, this is rough for Fig. She's in love with Raven. 
And you know, this was tough for me as a player because I'm like, no, Raven's such a good dude. I don't want to. I don't want to do this. But like, to me, this just made Iron Mask like even cooler in like a messed up sort of way. It just it gave him so much more of a nuance that it's like, man, like I already thought he was really intimidating, but now I have like an emotional investment in who Iron Mask is, and I don't want to kill him, but he's doing a bad thing. Because, like, so at this point, you find out that Raven's whole thing is he, he did kill the previous Iron Mask, and he's just kind of trying to continue what he was doing because he feels like that's the only way that maybe the kids that he's taking care of will be able to grow up in a good world. It's like, that's extreme. You probably don't want to do that, but, you know, you, you, you get where he's coming from. Like, the world is so messed up, and he doesn't know if those kids are going to be able to come out all right. And he obviously really loves those kids. So it's like, to him, he's kind of at his wit's end, and he thinks this is an extreme that might work. He's like, this is this might guarantee that the kids will be able to have a good life one way or another. I'm going to get all the covenants. I'm going to start the apocalypse, <laughs> you know, for the kids. But obviously, you know, you can't let him do that. So... This boss fight was so good. So, you know, you go, you fight him, and he's wearing the mask. You know, he's wearing the, the outfit, the Iron Mask outfit and stuff, and he's talking to you. And I love something this game does, and I'll talk about it a little more in the gameplay, but the fact that when you're, like, doing battles and stuff, the characters talk, and they say specific things depending on what's going on. And, like, you got, like, Arrow when he's doing attacks and stuff against Raven, you're, like, yelling at him and stuff. And Melody's, Melody's pissed. She's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill you. And it's just very emotional. It was very, it was a very like, I don't want to say like fun scene. Like yeah, it w- but it, it was. It was very, it was very dramatic, very emotional. And you know, like you're like attacking Raven with arrow, and he's he's like 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 screaming Raven and stuff like this. And at some point during the fight, like his mask like cracks, and so he like throws it off. And then you're just fighting Raven, like as. Iron Mask, but you know, like you gotta, you gotta stare at Raven now, and you gotta, you gotta come to terms with what you're doing. So obviously, you know, you beat him, and then, you know, he's like dying because I kind of have to kill him, and so then Feig obviously is like she's emotionally distraught at this point. She's like, I can't have this happen, and then she rushes in and she tries to soul hack Raven, but like Raven doesn't want to come back. Raven's kind of made peace with his decision. He's like, you know, you guys killed me kind of might makes the right sort of thing like maybe your way is the right way you kind of won fair and square sort of thing so raven doesn't want to come back therefore fig can't bring him back and because she was like the closest one to him when when he died all the covenants besides like arrows like go into her essentially so now fig has fig has all the covenants and stuff and raven dies and she was in love with raven you guys killed him <laughs> killed him essentially so you kind of think okay well that's the end, you know, we, 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 it sucked, but you did what you had to do, you kind of stopped the apocalypse, you kind of celebrate and stuff, like, not completely, like, obviously, everyone's very upset about it, Melody's upset about it at the end, too, because, you know, it's still, she still doesn't have her boyfriend anymore, and Arrow just had to kill the guy he looked up to forever, so they kind of have a heart-to-heart, which is a very nice scene, and, you know, everyone's, everyone is upset, but you kind of, at the same time, you know, you did accomplish what you needed to do. And at this point, I thought, okay, maybe the game's just kind of... I, I didn't think so. I thought something was going to happen. I just didn't know what, because, you know, with how these games kind of are, you always know that something really big is going to escalate at the end. But I didn't know what was going to happen. It felt like the end, but I knew I knew it wasn't going to be the end. So so you, you, kind of, you kind of realize that, you know, Fig isn't super happy with what you did, understandably. She's very upset, so she she kind of runs off on her own, and you know Ringo's like, "What's going on?" You know, I, and then everyone kind of starts putting two together and be like, "Oh no, like we gotta talk to her." Right? Like she might be uh, really upset about what's what what happened there, and you you as Ringo talk to Fig like one on one back at like everyone like the hideout, and. The Feigs essentially, and again, like these scenes, like back to back, were getting me so hard. And she's like, "I'm sorry, but I can't stay here anymore. Like I don't belong here." Like, essentially, you know, at that point, like Ringo can't stop her, and she tries, but she can't stop Fig because at this point, Fig is your new enemy. Fig, and again, I, I swear, I saw people say like, "Oh, I saw this coming." I didn't. I didn't at all. Again, maybe I'm dense. Maybe I'm the perfect candidate to play this game because I didn't see any of these twister turns coming. Like, maybe the fact that 
you know, Iron Mask wasn't Iron Mask, but not Iron Mask being Raven, and certainly not Fig becoming the enemy. But it was really... They did this in a really good way, because it was like... Again, the scene with Ringo trying to stop Fig was very, like, emotionally charged. But you kind of also realize that, yeah, you know, this whole game, you haven't really, like, talked to Fig about how she was feeling. She was just kind of giving you information, and you're hanging out with her, but you haven't talk to her to see her perspective on things she's just kind of going with what the group is doing to stop the apocalypse but then you know she's at this point she was emotionally attached to raven she was in love with raven and this kind of starts to counteract what she was trying to do because she wanted to stop the apocalypse but she was also in love with raven so now this is there's a conflict of interest here so now at this point fig has all the covenants she has like no well not all of them but I don't think she had all of them. I think Arrow still had his own, but so she's like, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the world now because you know she was she was like very upset. She was in emotional pain, and she was like, I'm gonna carry on what Raven was doing, which was like, wow. So you know you get now you get to go to like the final dungeon. This dungeon was really cool. It was like all like underwater at first and stuff, and it looked all like like ethereal and kind of messed up but then like near the end it was like this like flesh stuff and bones and it was you know it was just all over the place because it was like reality bending kind of stuff and you get to fig and you know obviously there's no talking her out of it and you get the final boss fight with fig which again i did not see that coming and the music is so good at this point. It's just like really getting me in the mood for this boss fight. And I'm going to talk about the music next because I have a lot to say about this. But yeah, the music's super good. This boss fight's like emotionally charged. You're fighting Fig. I don't want to fight Fig. And one thing I got to say that I love like up until this point. So Fig was like your navigator. I think like, you know, Morgana and Persona 5 or whatever. Teddy and 4. Um, and then after Fig leaves the party, you just get like a, a generic like kind of like male voice as you navigate with no like picture or anything and i thought that was a really good way of being like see what happened like you don't you know you don't get to have figure around anymore and it's like oh man so mu- music's cranked up it's super good and you're like fighting fig you don't want to fight fig and fig's kind of hard too you know she, she might she might be kicking your butt a little bit and then she, you, you beat like her first phase and then she's like this monstrous kind of being and stuff and she kind of ditches the human looking form and you know you 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 fight that off and eventually you know you kind of talk to her and you soul hack her because you know you like you killed her essentially and then Ringo's like all right you got to come back you know like the guys will kill me if I don't bring you back with me and she's like no like I I don't I don't I don't want to like I kind of I've made my peace I've done my I've done what I've done and then you see, like, the soul of Raven or something, and he's like, no, like, like I think you should go. I think you should go with them and stuff, and, like, I don't want you to do this. And then she's like, oh, you know, I guess I guess I will and stuff. So then you, you bring Fig back, and everyone kind of has, like, I guess a happy ending. But then, he, again, I kind of wasn't seeing this coming, and I definitely should have, but everyone kind of parts ways after that. And it was a little upsetting, and I think, you know, Maybe not upsetting, but it was sad, and I think it was supposed to be, but, you know, like, because at the end of the day, now that everything was taken care of and you accomplished your end goal, besides Ringo and Fig, who were finally, like, actually, like, talking to each other, uh, everybody did kind of have different goals, and they're, they don't have a reason to, like, stick around when they have their own things to be doing, and so it was kind of sad at the very end that you, you went through this huge journey with everyone, and you essentially stopped the apocalypse, and... You had a lot of investment in what was going on and stuff, but then everyone kind of, you know, because they are their own people and they have their own things going on, they do split up. I, 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 I did like that. It was, it was sad, but I thought that was a really good way to end it off. And definitely with the way they did it, and I don't think we'll ever see, like, a sequel to this directly. I don't think we'd ever have these characters again. I think what they did is done. But I did really like the story. I, I really liked where it went. And while, while I do think, like, the beginning of it, if I'm being critical, was slow. But I think there was enough intrigue 
where it didn't feel like a total grind to me. And again, like I also like that kind of stuff. I like a slow burn. I like I like feeling a payoff for being patient and waiting through something. And not that I feel like it was totally like a slog or anything, but it was definitely, you know, it kind of inched its way towards getting more and more um, interesting. But I feel like this game did a good job of constantly escalating and not just in the sense where, like, oh, the threat is getting bigger and bigger, but more of your stakes in the threat is getting more personally invested. And it, I felt like, especially by the time you got to, like, the Raven part and you figure out who he is, so, like, the rest of the story at that point, I was just, like, I was so invested at that point. Like, every scene was just, like, oh, my God, I don't know what's going to happen next. And, I like, I loved every, every second of it. So, I do think... I do think like the story overall. Again, if I have to be if I have to be critical here, it's definitely not like the best thing Atlas has ever produced. I certainly think there's 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 better stuff, but I think it was, I think it was a really cool take on their kind of formula, and it was something. Everything kind of felt more personal. Like the 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 bad guys weren't like bad guys. They were doing something bad, but they weren't bad people, and their motivations made sense. It's not like Again, if, I, I'm not trying to make a direct comparison here, but again, you, like you play Persona Four or Five or whatever, and like the people you're fighting against are just bad people, and yeah, you may be able to sympathize with something here and there, but like they're objectively not good people. But with this, the the nuance is more gray. It's like, yeah, like what Raven was doing was bad, but he had a very good reason for doing that. It's like, and what Fig was doing at the end was very bad. But again, like you understood why she was doing this and it sucked and you didn't want see that I think that's why I liked it so much. You didn't want to fight them. You didn't want to fight either of them. It's like I don't want I don't want to kill these people. I don't want I don't want to wait, can I say that? I don't know if I can say that. Um Yeah, you don't you don't want to do what you're you're doing, but like you have to for the greater good. And I felt more of a personal investment in the characters I was fighting against, which it makes them harder to get through in, in like a fun way, in a, in, a, in a more engaging way. Not that, you know, there's a reason to have both camps, but I personally really enjoyed what this had to offer. While I think overall, like the story itself, is a bit of a is is weaker than, especially you know stuff like SMT four or Persona five or four or whatever. I think the more personal moments are very good, and I really like what they did with it. So I feel like that kind of wraps up the story and what I think about it overall. I I liked it a lot, especially for more of the personal moments. It was different and a little more generic than some of the other stuff they've done, but I feel like it definitely made up for it with more of the personal aspects of the characters and what you were going against. So, that was a, that was a, that was a long section. Hope you're sticking with me cuz we got a couple more to go cuz now I really 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 want to talk about the music of it. So, let's take a quick breather. Hope everyone's still with me. Take a break if you need to come back to this later. I know this is a super long video. So, you know, just chill out for a second. Get that all out of your system. Because I know that was pretty heavy-handed at the end. Especially if you kind of... If you do what I do when you listen to these types of videos, you kind of play through the events in your head as you listen to someone else talk about it. You're like, oh, yeah, that scene or that happened. And then you kind of relive playing through it again and all your emotional investment. And you're like, oh, man, like that stuff sucked. and Or that was really interesting. Or if you're like me, you know, you beat a long RPG like this and you're like... Oh man, now what do I do? And then you kind of relive that again as you listen to someone talk about it. Like, man, that was so good. You know, with some people's opinions on this game, you might not be feeling the same way. But, regardless. Uh, now, now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about music. So, as some of you may know, at least some of the compositions, I don't think all of them, but some of the compositions were done by one of the main composers for some of the, the near music from the near games, and that music is absolutely incredible, and it's very, like, I wouldn't say orchestral, but I really like the vocals and how ethereal they sounded. It it really adds to some of the emotional tension in scenes, and I think having that composer on board with, like, the boss themes and stuff was a really good call, and I felt like it really was driving home some extra importance on those bosses and really made me feel like connected to what was happening i think that was such a good call that that person's a really good composer and really is good about heightening an emotional intensity of a scene through their music and their composition i think that was such a good call 
like that music was really good during the boss fights and stuff. Um, however, I will say, like the rest of the music, like not the fights, like the overworld stuff, like the, some of it's kind of comfy. Like if we're talking about like the music you hear when you're like in the towns or at the bar or whatever, but like the dungeon music, I will say it does kind of suck. It's, so the music itself is not bad. It's like it's just very generic though and the problem is like the different dungeons don't have like different songs and the same with the soul matrix so as you're doing everything you just hear this kind of like low in the background hum and I, I know there's more to it than that but there isn't nothing going on from a musical standpoint with the song and i'll be honest like a lot of times while i was going through the soul matrix stuff i was just like listening to videos or music or whatever because it's like there's no voice dialogue going on until I get to the next major scene, and I'm just going to be hearing the same low drone over and over again. And I'm, I don't, again, I don't like being over, overly critical. That's not my thing. But like, you know, I have to be realistic here. Uh, the music for all the normal stuff is not good because it is boring, and boring music is not good. Granted, it's not like Resident Evil director's cut basement music, where which is like laughable at least it wasn't that but it's i feel like it's almost more a of a grave sin for music to be boring because at least with basement music i remember what that sounds like and at least right now because i'm fresh off the game i still remember what the music sounds like but i'm not going to remember that like you know a year from now what the like the dungeon music sounds like compared to like you know you play Persona 4 or something, or SMT4, especially SMT4, and 5, like, you remember what that music sounds like, but with this, I don't, I don't think it's memorable, I don't think that stuff is, which is such a weird contrast, because the battle themes and the boss themes and stuff, I'm going to remember what those sound like, those, those are really, really great tracks, uh, it's just such a, uh, a, and I think because of how good those tracks are, it's, there's a wide, wide divide compared to, like, normal dungeon music and like boss fight music where one end of it's incredible and the other end's like eh which i don't want i don't ever want music to be boring that is very bad so i will be critical of that music could have been a lot better only because and it's a shame because like the highs of the highs with the music were incredible but it's very low when it's boring and i don't like that and they definitely should have had more variety in, in that and i understand it was kind of like a budget title in some ways but I don't think that excuses having a couple more compositions in here. Like, they definitely should have put a little more of a priority into that. However, I don't think anything, like... It's not like it didn't fit with what was going on. But again, not enough variety, and it wasn't memorable enough. So, music, I do think, is like a low point in some regards. So, next very, very big, important topic I want to get to... You don't need a breather for this one. We're going straight into it. Uh, we're going to talk about gameplay. So here's where this game, I think, absolutely excels at. So, you know, no, no big no big spoiler here, but it does not have the press turn system. It's not like SMT3 or, you know, 5 or the Persona games where, or modern Persona, where, you know, you hit a weakness or a critical and you get an extra turn or you miss one or you get something reflected and you lose like a turn or whatever, which I love that system. I think that system is very good, but I will say, I think it was a, it was very fresh to have something different. And I know, I know people didn't like that to not have like the press turn system, but well, I, I don't think it was less that people didn't like the fact that they didn't have the press turn system, that they just didn't like the gameplay, which or the, the quirk of the gameplay this time, which is totally fair. But to me, I was happy to have something different after coming off of SMT5 so recently it's it's nice that it wasn't just the same formula back to back so we'll, we'll start with that the fact that yeah the way weaknesses and stuff work in this game when you hit them you get like an additional counter into this meter called like a sabbath meter and i, I well it's not a meter it's a count you get just one two three four five or whatever it's not like there's no individual discrepancies with there and every time you hit a weakness you're charging up the Sabbath is what they call it. And then you do like big damage. And you can either through different modifiers target like one enemy. Or you might be able to heal after doing it. Or gain additional charges for not hitting weaknesses with different modifiers. But the whole the whole like loop of it is trying to hit weaknesses to 
get an even bigger attack by the end of your turn. And I will say, like, at first, I was like, this isn't punishing enough. <laughs> like, to me, if, if you, if you like, really enjoy the gameplay of SMT stuff, you, you want to be actively punished for messing up. Like, if you hit something and it reflects, you want to, like, lose your turns. Because that... Because then you really have to interact with the gameplay, and you really have to learn how to play around that kind of stuff. But I feel like, especially towards, like... Because at first, when I was playing it, I'm like, this is way too easy. Um, even on, like, hard mode, I'm like, I'm not I'm not getting beat up enough. But I feel like with how drastic some of the healing and HPs of some of the demons get to me in some of the boss fights, like, the Sabbaths become totally necessary, and especially the condensing Sabbaths into one target and really trying to work around doing that. Like, even by the time I got to, like, mid-game, I wasn't even thinking about it anymore. This was just, like, an integral part of the gameplay. I didn't feel like they were handing it to me anymore. I, I felt like I really had to work around the system and learn what I was doing. So, just like... Well, no, not just, like, SP. If anything, this game really reminds me of, like, Persona 1 and 2. Well, both two duology. In the sense that every person has their own demon. So it's not just like, you know, if we're talking about like modern Persona or SMT where, so you got, well, okay, let's talk about SMT instead. So SMT, you got main character and then three demons. And, but in this, it's like, or, or more depending on what, what, what game or whatever, like Soul Hackers, isn't it like five demons and one party member? Well, we're not talking about the most. So. Anyways, rambling. Point being is like, even Ringo can change out her demon. And everybody else can change out their demon, which is essentially what gives them their abilities and what gives them their resistances and their weaknesses and stuff. So everybody gets to change it out. Everybody gets to have whatever. Um, and what I really, really liked about the equipment facet of this is that you have different augments as far as like, oh, you can equip this to do 30% more like electric damage or... This will do 30% more when hitting a weakness, but it has a lesser grade to it. So someone that's not as efficient with that element can still equip it as long as you're, you know, hitting weaknesses. Or you'll have it, like, it'll cost more MP, but it'll do twice as much damage. And all these kind of, like, augments to your elements and stuff. I really, especially near the end of the game, I was really enjoying the interactivity of the system. There was, like, some boss I was trying to beat, uh, I, I was able to get a bunch of equipment to give people lightning spells that I didn't have, or electric spells that I didn't have with their current demons. Because what, what I, how I how I was playing this was like every time I hit a new level, I was pretty much swapping on a demon and just getting the highest tier one uh, that I could get at that point. But like I really needed everybody to have like an electric spell for this one boss fight, and I was able to give them equipment to give them like medium electric spells, even though I was at the point of the game where I had like the high tier electric spells. But I was able to augment it with, like, the electric boosting equipment because I had, like, three equipment slots. And I was able to give everyone, like, electric hitting moves and, like, work around my demons to give, like, Saizo the electric demon thing that I had so that he could still use electric because he couldn't use, like, any electric augments. And kind of give my give my uh, party member exactly what I needed during that boss fight. And that was such a fun moment for me, like, putting together this puzzle, essentially, and making my party the exact right toolkit for what I needed for that fight. That was such a cool moment for me. I do wish that those types of augments could have came a little earlier as far as being able to, like, say, you know, I need everybody to have an electric spell. That would have been nice to have that type of equipment a little earlier. But I could also see how that would have broken the balance a little bit. So it's kind of, like, up in the air whether or not that would have been better or worse. But the gameplay opened up way more near the end and definitely near the beginning it is a little too simple and you feel like you're a little too overpowered but i don't feel like it takes too long before you start interacting with the systems more and more but i feel like with, especially with some of the augmenting of your spells and stuff that could have come a little earlier but again overall especially when you start doing like the higher level stuff or if you play on like the highest difficulty uh the gameplay is like really good and there's a lot of customization to it you can really start to hone in, especially in the late game, like what exactly you want to do. You have these uh, additional modifiers that Ringo herself can use that will, like, and I, I love the system too. It reminds me a lot of the um, Magatsuhi skills from SMT5. I think that's what those were called. Or, or the Kagatsuhi. I don't remember. Where, like, in that game, you could get, like, all criticals for a turn or whatever and, like, increase all your press turns and stuff. For this, uh, Ringo had abilities like overclock where every hit no matter what even if it wasn't like an enemy's weakness will give you a stack for your sabbath 
or she had ones where you can get someone two turns in a row, which is really nice to, like, heal and then attack with that person, or she had ones that will condense the Sabbath, because normally Sabbath will hit every enemy, and even when, say, you're doing a boss fight, you're now just, like, like the main boss or something, it'll still do the damage as if it's getting separated, but you can, like, condense that damage to just that one target, and it'll all add up to that one target instead of getting spread out even when there's no other demons. So I like these kind of augments that you could get on top of, like, your ability and element augmenting. It just, it had a really good level of control over what you are doing and what you wanted to do. What this reminded me the most of was, like, Strange Journey and how you had the alignment system. Well, and I don't mean, like, story alignment. I mean, like, how in that game, if you haven't played it, say you had two demons that were of like chaos alignment and you hit a weakness with the one chaos demon then the other chaos demon will get a free extra hit and so you're kind of working with alignments to get additional hits and now they're not additional turns though so i feel like that's the closest comparison you can make it did remind me of the strange journey system i do think the strange journey system is better but i really did like interacting with the sabbath system and it felt like it felt like a, like a breath of fresh air compared to the press turn stuff, which I really do like that, but we've seen a lot of that. In even, like, I feel like SMT4 is way closer to press turn than it is not compared to, like, Strange Journey, where I definitely feel like at that point that was its own thing at that point. And maybe that's just my perspective of going into SMT4 after playing, like, Persona stuff where I felt like it was similar to press turn. But, it you know, thinking about it, it is, it is quite different, but... I feel like Strange Journey was even more of a deviation that also handled it very well, giving uh, giving the gameplay an extra quirk. And I, yeah, so like at the end, I really enjoyed working around the Sabbath. I really enjoyed augmenting everything. I liked getting all the demons and equipping them, and how everyone could equip a different demon. And I liked the different like defensive equipment you could get from the shops or quests or anything. Like from a gameplay standpoint, I feel like this game did really well. I think the balancing was super good. Um, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to get into spoilers for SMT5, but I do want to make that comparison since that was like the, the previous game they put out. I feel like at the end of SMT5, this is, I'm not spoiling anything, just pure gameplay numbers kind of thing, where I feel like the end of that game was very unforgiving in the sense that you could barely level up and you could barely get any levels. And it feels like they were really trying to get you to get like the grinding DLC, and which I didn't do. So I was just kind of forcing myself to try to hunt down Mitamas and then very very slowly grind in like the last dungeon but at that point you need to be such a high level to do some of that stuff and it just felt like they were really they kind of dropped the ball on the difficulty scaling at the very very end of the game but with this game i felt like everything was just right like everything everything felt like a like a still it was still a challenge when you got the boss fights but i didn't feel like oh i wasn't gaining enough levels or i wasn't able to get good enough equipment where, like, you know, comparatively at the end of SMT5, I felt like they were really trying to shove that DLC down my throat with how the difficulty spiked super hard. Um, at least with the route I was trying to go with, maybe that was my fault, but, you know, I feel like Soul Hackers 2 did a very good job of being very fair and balanced, while still, like, tough. It wasn't unforgiving. And I like the unforgivingness, don't get me wrong, but I feel like as, like, a playthrough, this game was very well balanced and it was very even throughout all of it. Everything felt super fair. Not like hand-holding, but yeah, everything was very balanced, very fair. I enjoyed the gameplay a lot. I think it was some of the best stuff they've done. I do think, like, SMT4 and 5 are better, and especially, like, SMT4 Apocalypse, like, that game's gameplay is probably, like, the peak, but as far as, like, customizing and everything like that, this is, this is like, some of the best stuff they've done. I really, really enjoyed the gameplay. So, with that... We're going to get to my next section. We're going to talk about the technical perspective of this game. And with that, I want to know what happened. So <laughs> so I played it on the Series X. I was debating whether or not getting on PC or Series X. But I, I wanted a physical disc with this. I wanted something to play on my Series X. So, um, yeah, like, so it has two options. It has, like, a 4, uh, 4K 30 FPS mode. And then it has, an eight, like, I think it was 1800p. 60 FPS mode. Uh, but from my understanding, it's very light on PC um, as far as how hardware intensive it is. So I don't understand how they couldn't have accomplished a 4K 60 mode with the type of visuals that it had. So something with that engine, 
uh, was definitely inefficient. There's no doubt about it. Because especially with if you're talking about computational power compared to eight like 1800p to 4k, there's like yeah, there's there's a difference. Obviously, numbers going up, but there's not such a drastic difference that I don't understand how they couldn't have optimized just slightly more to get a 4k 60. Which you know, I'm not saying it needs to be 4k 60. Like yeah, it's definitely like excessive and stuff. Um, how, however, like the, I, I think from a design point and like models and stylistically and art style, it's very good. It's very sharp. It's very has a very unique kind of style to it, and I really like the atmosphere and. Again, like how characters look. The the portraits during the battle are very like nice in the four K thirty mode. Um, but then again, that kind of goes back to a little problem when you do like performance mode. Then the UI itself is the slightly lower resolution, and to me, like the game kind of looks unnecessarily blurry sometimes. Especially, and I don't understand how. Maybe they went overhanded with like motion blur or something but it doesn't even look like this game really has that much motion blur but to me like i'm i'm a pretty like technically knowledgeable person and i'm not trying to like like toot my own horn with this kind of stuff but i I, i'm really into computers i have learned a lot over the years about everything and i understand hardware a fair amount and stuff to me and i don't this is what i don't understand like the 1800p mode it like looks like way worse than the 4k mode like it, like especially if you're looking at the distance and stuff, like things look way blurrier, and I don't understand why. Because if these numbers are correct, there is no way that it should look that much worse. And for like 99% of the time, I'm going to choose like the performance mode over a graphics mode. But to me, like it's a turn-based RPG. I'm not getting that much more out of the 60 FPS with this. There's nothing that requires reaction time, so I just played like the whole game in 4K 30. Because one of my biggest problems, and I wish. I wish they could have figured out a way around this because I know I know you don't have to do it like this, but the UI and like the porches and stuff in battle, they're tied to the resolution. So when you bump down the resolution, the porches themselves are no longer like 4K, even though there is no way that the UI and the menus couldn't be 4K. And maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe they're gonna patch it up, but I'm pretty sure when I was like really looking at it, I'm like, yeah, the portraits are just going down in quality and stuff, and the UI is going down in quality when I'm bumping down the resolution, which that. You should be able to have a clean, still be able to retain like the clean 4K UI while still actually running the game internally at a lower resolution with all the 3D graphics and stuff. Like the, the UI should just be a front end on top of everything else, just an overlay. It shouldn't be affected by the internal resolution. It would look a lot sleeker if your UI itself doesn't get, you know, it doesn't go down with resolution along with like the whole rendering of the everything else itself. And then, not that I played it on this, but I saw some of the performance on, like, base Xbox One and base PS4. And once again, I have to be like, what happened? There is no excuse for how poor that this was performing. It was, uh, I was watching the Digital Founder video on this, and, like, they were showing base Xbox One performance in, like, um, the one town area. And it was dropping so hard. And it's like, there is no reason for this. There is nothing in this game that is that graphically intensive. It is definitely... You could, there's no way you couldn't have got like a, a 720-30 out of this, like stably. Like, from a graphical standpoint, for what they're running, this is inefficient code. There's no other way around it. Like, this code is just inefficient. Granted, again, it's a turn-based RPG. It's whatever. You don't need this kind of stuff. But at least a stable 30 for, like, last-gen owners, is, I feel like they could have done it. And I'm not saying, like, I understand what stuff, like, if we're talking about, like, Cyberpunk, both, because that's, that's, that's the one everybody wants to talk about. It's it is very technically demanding, but it was also very inefficient to launch. Granted, I feel like they cleaned up their stuff a lot, but at least with stuff like that, you understood why, like, last-gen versions were so rocky. But with this, it's like there is nothing going on that that should be this computationally expensive. It, does, it doesn't make sense. I, I don't mind the more minimalistic look to everything because the art style really makes up for it. But when you're going for this, this more limited rendering of everything things are more simple things are more plain some of the texture work isn't like the most amazing thing ever i don't understand with this art style and with everything that's going on well with the lack of everything that's going on how this was getting such poor performance on the last gen machines it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me and like i said like i'm, I'm not trying to act like i'm like a know-it-all this kind of stuff but I, I do i do understand quite a quite a bit about running this kind of stuff and it, to me especially when you look at like the pc requirements and you look at look at people running on pc this doesn't make sense. I don't know what's going on. Like something messed up along the way. And again, especially when we're talking about like the next gen machines, 
There's no reason this can be done 4K 60. There's definitely just some inefficiency in the coding. And I didn't mean to, like, go on a tangent with that. Because overall, you know, at least with the next-gen stuff, if you just throw it on either of the modes, you're still getting a good experience. It just, it definitely could have been better. And I don't really think that's a budget issue. It just, it, it was a coding issue. A, a as, as far as inefficiency with whatever engine they're using. Like, I know they're running through Unity, but they're obviously probably modifying stuff. So, they just, they should and granted, you know, maybe though, because I don't know, because maybe it all comes down to it really was just a money and time issue, and they didn't know how well this was going to sell, and they just did not have time to look into it a little more. Because it's not like what we got is bad, it's just questionable. It's it's like, it's more so questionable about why wasn't it better, not that it's currently bad on at least next-gen stuff, but as far as last-gen concerned, it definitely, it definitely could have used more polish, and it could have used more work, especially like base xbox one like there's definitely they could they could they could have done better with that maybe even implement some sort of dynamic resolution that way they could have caught a little bit of the hiccups in like the town areas and stuff with base xbox one and ps4 and stuff and i don't know maybe unity doesn't support dynamic resolution i don't know but i it have a hard time believing that you couldn't find a workaround with that like you could probably program it in somehow or I also kind of doubt that Unity just wouldn't have a feature like that at all. I'm sure there's some Unity games out there that do support dynamic resolution. That could have at least, if you wanted to be, I don't want to say lazy about it, because I understand this kind of stuff is very hard work and stuff, but if you didn't have time to really hone in on performance, this at least would have been a good backup to catch some of the hiccups. Well, like, look at, like, SMT5. Now, granted, that was Unreal and stuff, but they did employ dynamic resolution, and it did pick up a lot of the hiccups. Now, not all the time or whatever, but that game... That game looks better, in my opinion, honestly. Like, obviously, it's on the Switch, and it's running a way lower resolution, but, like, the quality of the assets and everything and how it's at least picking up its performance and stuff, that game just came out better. And, uh, granted, that probably had a way higher budget and stuff, so it's kind of hard to compare it directly between the two because this is probably way more so, like, hey, we can allot this much of a budget to make a sequel to Soul Hackers, and it's not going to be the S&P 5 budget, but it's still, like... Part of you as a consumer does want to be like, yeah, I understand that this was more of a budget title, but uh, you still kind of don't want your Switch release looking better than your Series X release. Now, resolution-wise, you know, Soul Hacker 2, way higher, way sharper, but I feel like the quality and overall vision, graphically speaking, of SMT5 holds up way better. Not holds up, because they're both monitors, but it looks way better. at the Because, like, you know, when, you, when you're playing a game for a while and stuff, you kind of just get used to how it looks. And, you know, yeah, Switch games are way lower resolutions and stuff, but you get you get used to the way it looks, and you kind of, like, tone it, like, tune it out a little bit. And then you kind of just looking at it, like, from an artistic point of view. And, you get like, SMT5 looks amazing. And then, yeah, Soul Hacker 2, way higher resolution, way sharper. And it's got a nice, distinct visual style, but I still think it looks worse. You know, not, not from a numbers point of view, not necessarily from a style point of view, but from a quality point of view, like the models and everything, I think are way, and the lighting especially, I think is just way better in S&P 5. Granted, that's Unreal, that's Unity, it's difference, there's differences, and there's probably way more customized than that, but there's definitely some like questionable choices, not that it's just bad, but there's, there's questionable choices from a technical perspective. And, you know, I'm really, I'm really into the tech side of things, I'm really into that kind of stuff, so I wanted to talk about that a little bit and kind of give my perspective on things. Like, at the end of the day, if you're playing on the next-gen stuff, you're getting a fine experience. Even if you're on the last-gen stuff, you can still, like, play it. It is a turn-based RPG. You're not going to be, like, suffering because of frame rate drops. But it's still, there is no, there, there, it could have been better. And PC, you're probably fine on, like, a potato. Like, I think, I think any old potato you find can run this, like, easily, which is what makes it even more confusing, honestly. So... That's kind of my, my uh, write-up on the technical perspective of it. I know I talked in circles a bunch there, but that's just kind of how my brain is. So now my last section is literally just a, like, ending the video kind of section. Just talking about any random last points I wanted to bring up. Because, you know, like this is a very free-form video. This is just me talking about how I felt about the game. Because at the end of the day, I'm making this video because I really, really liked Soul Hackers 2 overall. And I, I like, I'm very passionate about SMT stuff and I really wanted to like 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 put my love for this franchise into like a video like this. And I'll probably talk more about the other games at some point. But this is fresh in my head. I just finished playing this and I really wanted to talk about it because there's 
parts of it in seconds that I absolutely like love. So the one the one thing I do want to talk about though is like so when this was announced and me and like a lot of other people were like they're making a sequel to Soul Hackers. Like the Sega Saturn game, or for us Americans, you know, we got the translated 3DS version. Um, and it was like, wow, like, I'm like, what's the market for this? And like, what is this going to be like? And I will say, so now that it's out and now that we know and stuff, well, first of all, we could tell that they, they both dropped the SMT name and the Devil Summoner's name. Uh, so, you know, it's just Soul Hackers 2. I don't understand why they didn't just call the game Soul Hackers because I feel like for some people that are way outside of this fan base. They're going to look at Soul Hackers 2 and be like, well, I didn't play the first one, so I'm not going to touch that. There is no reason you need to play the first one to play this game. This has nothing to do with Soul Hackers 1, which is, in some ways, it's disappointing, but I kind of, you know, got over that very quickly, considering it is its own thing, and then once you kind of realize that, you're like, you're just using the type of aesthetic of Soul Hackers for a new story and a new idea, which is really cool. But for anybody that's, like, super diehard, which, you know, I, I am, but I also like the newer stuff, too. It is kind of like, why are you calling the Soul Hackers, too, when this, like, just straight up is not a sequel to Soul Hackers. It's just, like, like vaguely similar concepts and settings. Like, it has nothing to do with Soul Hackers. So that's just a little tangent. Me, I'm personally, I'm not too, like, 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 like upset over that. It, it is what... Like, I wouldn't expect a sequel to a Sega Saturn game. That, and also, I doubt the 3DS version even sold that well to begin with. Like, I think the aesthetic of Soul Hackers is really cool, and I love those old SMT games. I love the dungeon crawling. I love all that. But this game just isn't that. And so, yeah, maybe you should have had a different name. Maybe they should have just called it... They, like, I think they just should have called it Soul Hackers. You can drop all the names and stuff like that. Just call it Soul Hackers. Like, yeah, it's definitely an SMT game. It's definitely, like... A Devil Summoner game with all the comps and the Devil Summoners and stuff, but it is it is just like a reboot of that kind of like universe or that setting and those kind of like ideas. They should have just called it Soul Hackers. If been done with it, I think you probably would have got more people to hop on board because both they wouldn't be because if anybody was expecting like a remake of Soul Hackers, you know maybe they would have been a little confused. But then you would have just seen like a trailer and like, oh okay, it's just like it's a new property with the same name or whatever. Uh, I feel like that would have been way better if they would have just called it Soul Hackers. Not important to the game at all. Just a little tangent. Because I feel like it's going to make some people confused or some people upset. And it's like, oh, it's either not a sequel to Soul Hackers and you like Soul Hackers. Or, oh, I didn't play Soul Hackers so I can't touch this kind of thing. And then you have to explain to everybody, no, no, it doesn't have anything to do with Soul Hackers. You can just play it or whatever. And then that's a whole problem from a marketing point of view. It's like, they kind of messed up with that. They could have done something like way sleeker with what they were calling it and how they were describing it and probably even push it more in marketing so to speak because i didn't see too much you know about this game and i don't i don't think it's sold that well like anywhere granted i don't know i could be wrong because i also don't know how many people are buying this stuff digitally and you might not always see the numbers for that and stuff um it's just kind of like a, a little tangent yeah like as far as comparing it to soul hackers there's like nothing in common besides vague themes but as its own thing, if we're just standing it on its own. I, I really enjoyed it. Like, oh, and one more thing I do want to talk about before I end this video is DLC. Very, very, very bad. They should not have done anything they did with that DLC. Like, yeah, I love this game a lot, but I'm not blind to just corporate greed. They should not have had, like, like classic demons and Nemissa from Soul Hackers 1 locked behind DLC. They definitely shouldn't have had a dungeon with story content locked behind the, the DLC. Now, like, you could play through the whole game and it doesn't matter what happens during that story DLC, but you should never be taking away story and a dungeon day one in an RPG like that. Like, that is that is egregious, and they should not have done that. Cosmetic stuff, music, whatever, I don't care about that. That doesn't affect the gameplay. That's fine. Do whatever you want. Like, no, it's not fine. It should be in the game. It should definitely just be in the game, but that's not going to affect your gameplay experience. But, like, demons and story stuff in a dungeon, that definitely does. Like, that was that was really crappy business decisions. I don't agree with any of that. Like, you can be a diehard fan of this kind of stuff like I am and still call it out. It's, it's like, it's, it's, it's bad. It's bad for the consumer. It's bad for business because it makes you look bad. It's just a bad idea. So, I don't know how many people bought into the DLC and stuff. Like, yeah, I, I got I got the, the story DLC stuff because I didn't know how important it was going to be. And I didn't want to, like, miss out on story stuff and dungeon stuff. And, like, I think the dungeon and stuff and the story 
in it is fine, and I really like enjoyed the dungeon stuff, but it should have been part of the main game. It, there is no excuse for that, because it was obviously done day one, and it could have been part of the game. There is no reason for that. I will not stand by day one DLC stuff. I hate that kind of stuff. It should not... That just Because then it plagues the discussion around the game, and it, it creates a lot more negativity when... People could just be talking about how the game looks, how like the music is, how the gameplay looks, but instead you get a lot more people talking about, hey, what's with all this like egregious day one DLC? And then you have more people talking about that, because obviously negativity spreads easier and faster and stuff, and people get more outraged about that kind of stuff. And yeah, they, they should. It's it's bad business. Like, yeah, you might get some people to spend more money, but then at the same time you're getting a lot of bad press. And I don't think Bad press is never good for a video game. Never good for, a, well, maybe a movie, because then you might see it because if it's just bad, you know, because it's fun. But a video game is something you have to spend a lot of time to get through and to complete, and you're going to be spending a lot of time on it. You don't want your video game to have bad press in any way, shape, or form, because that's only going to hinder it. Unless it's something, like, stupid and trivial. But, like, expensive day one DLC is not trivial. It is not dumb. Like, people have every right to complain about that. It was... Uh, it was a really bad move, and it was a lot of the talking points for before this game actually came out was just about the DLC and the story DLC. And I feel like they really gave themselves some bad press with essentially like a new IP they were trying. Because, yeah, it's Soul Hackers too, but, you know, it's kind of just a new idea. They really shouldn't have bogged down a new idea with day one DLC like that. Because like, that really, I feel like that did not give the game good press before it came out. But... At the, at the end of the day, as far as, say, you were just to go out and you're going to, like, pick up a disc of this or just buy the normal version digitally or whatever, I'd say screw all the DLC, don't get any of it. Like, unless you really want another dungeon, the story, and the story stuff, like, like, don't feel like you're missing out, though, if you don't get it. Like, just, you know, just get the disc. Oh, granted, I don't know why I'm telling you this. If you've gotten this far in this video, you've been spoiled completely. Uh, so, you probably already bought the game. However, you know, if you just tell somebody else, you know, that is interested in the game, I'll go from that, from that perspective, uh, just get, like, just buy the game, that's it. Don't get anything, don't get any extra stuff, just buy the game. I feel like that would also kind of maybe show Atlas, you know, hey, we don't, we don't want this kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, that was part of the problem. I got the story DLC. I didn't know how important it was going to be. And I, like I said, I enjoyed it, but it shouldn't have been there. So just buy the game, or tell other people just to get the base game and just play that. And also, though, I feel like some of the negativity surrounding it, it like, not the DLC stuff, like, that's totally warranted, but I feel like some people were making too many comparisons to either Persona or SMT, when this kind of definitely was its own thing. More SMT than Persona, but it was definitely, like, its own thing, and some people, I feel like, were a little too harsh on this. And granted... You know, at the end of the day, if you were bored by it or if you didn't like certain aspects of it, like, that's totally fine. But to me, I feel like some opinions, especially nowadays, are, like, all, at least from, like, an online discourse, it's it's either really positive or it's really negative, And you really don't see much in between. And, like, let's be real. Like, like there's, there's always an in-between with stuff. And, like, yeah, you can hate this game if you want. But I doubt everybody that's talking about it like that way absolutely hates it and think it's like the worst thing they've ever done. It's it, it's it's not. I could like I totally get it if you're like, no, it was mediocre or it didn't really click with me or I didn't like the gameplay or something. It's like I could see that, but I don't think you could objectively call it like a terrible game. You could be not interested in it, but it's not like it was a buggy mess, it's not like it was garbage writing or anything like that. Or like like truly garbage. Like, there are bad games out there. This is not one of them. This could be something you're not into, and this could be something that's mediocre to you and just average. But I feel like if you're really into SMT and you want something new, you know, I feel like you would enjoy this a lot. I feel like you'd probably be somewhere in the camp of me. Like, I'm not going to take it too seriously. You know, I, I'm a very diehard SMT fan, but, you know, having something that's a little more lighthearted and a little less serious is totally fine in my book, too. And I really... Not, you know... There's only so much lightheartedness you can get with the Apocalypse, but it was a different tone. You know, it's definitely this game had a different tone, a lot more personal issues while not being straight up social sim like New Persona. I feel like it, it struck a really good balance of all the things that make up like SMT and some Persona stuff in there as well, and while it definitely came out being its own thing. And I enjoyed it immensely. I think the highlights were definitely like the characters and the gameplay. 
I think. And then the story, the story too, was like good. Um, but the characters themselves and their interactions, I think, were a real highlight, along with like the gameplay and like the boss music and stuff. Yeah, overall, I did enjoy it a lot. I do see some of the negative points, but yeah, I really enjoyed this game. And I just really wanted to talk about it. It definitely has a pretty big impression on me. And no, it's not going to be my favorite like SMT game I've ever played or anything. But it was a, it was a really good time, and I really liked the characters a lot. Some of those scenes like really got me and stuff. And the gameplay towards the end was like ve- a very good loop of getting new stuff and augmenting your abilities and all that, all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to ramble on too long. I love this game. I wanted to talk about it because I enjoyed it a lot. That should wrap it up. Hope you enjoy the video. Hope you were able to chill out and do whatever you need to do. Uh, later.